Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the OBGYN podcast. Today, we are going to finish up our conversation about contraception. In the previous episodes, we have discussed the role of contraception in our society and the history and effectiveness of the various forms of hormonal and barrier contraception, as well as IUDs. The one thing that all of these methods have in common is that they are reversible. Now, in this episode, we are going to discuss the relatively modern history of permanent sterilization, which occupies a unique place in the contraceptive pantheon. So without further ado, let's get started with Episode 9, Contraception, Part 4. The history of contraception starts in an era before the modern condom. During the early 1800s, great strides were being made in the field of surgery, and the practitioners of this new art were constantly inventing new techniques. The idea for permanent sterilization owes itself, in part, to the cesarean delivery. Because in these early days of modern medicine, cesarean deliveries almost always meant death for the mother. But by the 1820s, there began to be records of successful cesareans. In fact, the first recorded successful cesarean performed in the British Empire was actually performed by Dr. James Stuart Barry, who interestingly enough was actually a woman, posing as a man for most of her life. Her story is fascinating in its own right, and is currently being made into a movie, so I won't go into it too much. But in any case, the first successful cesarean in the British Empire was performed by a woman. Great stuff. Well, when women began to survive a cesarean birth, it brought with it a whole new set of problems. What to do with these women if they get pregnant again? Now, although the outcomes of these early trials of labor after cesarean are not recorded, modern-day obstetricians can imagine what some of the outcomes must have been, especially considering that for most of this time, they didn't even close the uterine incision after the baby was delivered. Repeat cesareans were noted to be even worse, with an especially high mortality rate. In fact, by the 1880s, there were only six reported cases of a woman surviving a repeat cesarean delivery inside the United States. These horrific outcomes made obstetricians search for a way of preventing another pregnancy, if the woman was even fortunate enough to survive the first. They did this by removing the ovaries of women undergoing cesarean, which obviously worked very well in preventing pregnancy, but came with its own side effects. This was done out of a desire to protect these women from the horrific outcomes they had witnessed or heard about but removing the ovaries in young women causes a whole other set of life-altering problems. It was into this world that James Blundell came of age. He was born in 1791 in London and studied at the University of Edinburgh Medical School. He graduated in 1813 at the age of 22 and worked at Guy's Hospital in London as an obstetrician with his uncle, who was chief of staff. He is famous for having performed the first documented human-to-human blood transfusion in 1829 but he is important to our story because he was also the first person to suggest occluding or removing the fallopian tubes to prevent pregnancy. In an 1828 lecture at Guy's Hospital, he espoused the following, quote, If you intercept the contact between the semen and the rudiments, you ensure sterilization. Mere divisions of the tube might be sufficient to produce sterility, but the further removal of a portion of the tube appears to be a surer practice, end quote. Like other obstetricians at the time, he recommended that if a cesarean delivery was to be performed, that some sterilization procedure should also be performed to eliminate the chance of future pregnancy. However, unlike his peers, he felt that removing the fallopian tubes was a better and safer option. Now, unfortunately, we have no records of him performing the salpingectomies on his patients, but given his other exploits, it's hard to believe that he did not at least try. These early modern years of medicine are interesting in that knowledge seemed to spread in one of either two ways very quickly, or not at all. We saw this in the early work on contraception, and even with the spread of the diaphragm. Well, the latter happened in this case, and it wouldn't be until the late 1880s and 90s that tubal removal or ligation began to pick up steam, but then it happened fast, and by 1911 there were over 200 published reports of sterilization with many different techniques documented. The first of these was in 1880 and was published by Dr. Samuel Lundgren, who worked in Toledo, Ohio. He documented a repeat cesarean delivery, where amazingly the mother lived, and his decision to place a silk tie around each tube one inch from the cornua, as opposed to his standard practice of removing the ovaries. That's right, as far along as 1880, it was still standard practice to remove the ovaries at cesarean delivery. In any case, this was the first documented tubal ligation. You'll remember that Blundell recommended removal of the fallopian tubes, so just tying them off was novel at this point. Tubal ligation became the most popular form of sterilization, with removal or salpingectomy taking a backseat until much later in our story. The next few iterations happened quickly, with Dr. Durson recommending a double ligation as opposed to the single in 1895, 
This is, by the way, the same Durson who invented the Durson incision for fetal head entrapment during breech deliveries. Then, in 1897, Drs. Carrer and Butner started cutting the tubes between those sutures and removing a portion, just like Dr. Blundell had recommended. The next four methods that we're going to discuss are the ones that have stuck with us. Pretty much every tubal ligation done by laparotomy in the last 60 years was done by one of these methods. The first is from Dr. Irving, who published his method in 1924. Now it's a bit complicated, but it involved double ligating and cutting the tube, and then burying the end closest to the uterus in a tunnel cut into the muscle of the uterus itself. This was very effective, but time-consuming, and potentially bloody. The next was developed around the same time as Dr. Irving's, but is the philosophical opposite. Whereas Dr. Irving sacrificed speed for effectiveness, Dr. Pomeroy's method emphasized speed alone. His method involved grabbing a single portion of the tube and pulling it up to create a knuckle. Then one or two sutures is placed around the clamp to ligate the tube. Then the portion above the suture is cut off. His technique was published in 1929 by two of his colleagues, several years after he had died, and it remains popular today due to its simplicity. The next method was developed in Japan and shares many traits with the Irving technique. It was developed by Hajime Uchida during the 1950s. It involved injecting epinephrine into the serosa of the tube and then cutting it longitudinally for 5 centimeters. This portion of the exposed muscularis of the tube would be removed after tying off both ends. The end closest to the uterus would then be sutured into the mesosalpinx and the other end left free. He initially presented it in 1961, and by 1975, he reported on 20,000 cases he had performed with no known failures. The last major method is really a descendant of the Kara and Butner method from 1895. This is called the Parkland method because it was the technique of choice at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, and it spread from there. It is performed by grasping the mid portion of the tube with two clamps. The mesosalpinx is then cut, and the two sutures are placed at the proximal and distal ends and are tied. The intervening portion of the tube is then cut but unlike the Irving and Uchida methods, they are left as is. This is also much easier and faster than either of those two methods and is comparable more to the Pomeroy. Now I know it is hard to visualize some of these procedures, and so I place images of all of them in the show notes if you're interested and want to take a look. The next big moment in sterilization was the development of laparoscopy. Amazingly, the first laparoscopic tubal ligation was performed in the late 1930s in Switzerland by a Dr. Bosch. This is far earlier than I ever would have thought. Laparoscopy continued to develop in Europe, but remained stagnant in the U.S. mostly due to laws that made elective sterilization extremely difficult to perform. In the 1960s, as the laws and social norms changed, there was a resurgence in laparoscopy, and by the mid-1970s, sterilization became the most common indication for laparoscopy in the United States. Laparoscopic sterilization started with electrocautery, applied to the tubes to desiccate them, and is still a very popular technique. At first, they used unipolar cautery, which was invented by Dr. William Bovey in 1926 at Harvard. In monopolar or unipolar cautery, the energy is transmitted down the instrument and into the tissue. It then escapes out of the body through the use of a ground pad. The ground pad works by making an easy route for the electricity to follow, and by dispersing that energy over a broad area, which decreases the chance for burns. This type of energy leads to larger char areas on the treated tissue, and also for the potential for adjacent organs to be injured. In the early days of laparoscopic tubules, there were so many case reports of bowel injuries, and these surgeons started looking for alternative ways of performing it. The first was an invention by Dr. Jerry Hulko in 1973. Working at Chapel Hill in North Carolina, he developed a spring-loaded clip that was loaded onto an instrument, placed around the tube laparoscopically, and then activated. It would then clamp down on the tube and occlude it. Variations of this procedure with steel and silicone clips are still performed today, as it is fast, simple, and has few complications. The other development also occurred in 1973, and was the development of bipolar cautery. In this variation of electrosurgery, the current is passed down one half of a forcep or pronged instrument and into the tissue. Then, instead of dispersing into the body like unipolar, the current is returned through the opposite prong, completing the circuit. The result is far less tissue damage over a much smaller area. It also almost eliminated the chance of bowel injuries. Of note, the bipolar cautery was invented by a gynecologist, Jacques-Emile Roux, in Canada, and the first procedure it was used on was an abdominal hysterectomy. His technique was published in 1974, and by the 1980s it had become one of the most common methods of laparoscopic tubal ligation, along with the Hulk clip. In 
The next innovation in the field of tubal ligation began in 2002, with the approval of the Esher device. This procedure involves inserting a nickel-titanium steel alloyed coil into the fallopian tubes. The coils cause an inflammatory reaction which results in fibrosis and tubal occlusion. The procedure is performed using hysteroscopy and does not require any abdominal scission, which makes it very alluring. In many cases it can be done right there in the office, which completely eliminates the cost of surgery and anesthesia. Like vasectomy, which we'll get to in a minute, it does require three months for complete occlusion of the tube to occur, and a hysterosalpingogram is recommended to ensure success. So, unlike all of the other methods we've talked about so far, women need to use an alternative method until they are sure it's effective. The Esure has come into news a lot recently because there are mounting reports of complications, even years after placement. This includes failure to place both coils, which occurs about 5% of the time, perforation of the tube with the coil, which occurs about 2% of the time, and expulsion of the coil from the tube, and also about 2%. Added up, this means that almost 10% of cases are ultimately unsuccessful in achieving sterilization. The last complication that has been noted is pain. We are unsure of how many women have long-lasting pelvic pain after Esure because there hasn't been good data on this yet, but from the anecdotal reports it would seem to be a non-trivial number. All of this is combined to make Esure harder and harder to recommend to patients, at least until more research is done. The last female sterilization technique that I want to talk about is an old one, it's the complete salpingectomy. As I noted before, it was first recommended back in 1828 by Dr. Blundell. The reason that we have come full circle back to this technique actually has to do with breast cancer. In 1994, the first gene linked to breast cancer was discovered, the BRCA1 gene, or BRCA gene. This transformed breast cancer research and ultimately led to our understanding that breast and ovarian cancer are linked, at least in women who have the BRCA mutation. And because the lifetime risk of ovarian cancer is relatively high in these women, it is recommended that they have their ovaries and tubes removed when they are done childbearing. When they looked at the tubes of these women who were having prophylactic salpingectomies and oophorectomies, they found that many of them had abnormal areas in the fimbria of the tube that looked very similar to pre-ovarian cancer. This has led to the hypothesis that perhaps ovarian cancer, at least in these women, starts in the fallopian tubes and not in the ovaries. All of this research led people to start thinking about sterilization again. If we were sterilizing women anyway, why not remove the entire tube, especially if it might reduce the chance of ovarian cancer? Now I should note that doing a salpingectomy has not been proven to have any impact on the risk of ovarian cancer, but because the surgery is not that much more complicated to do than a cauterization or partial removal, it is slowly catching on. Now before I talk about male sterilization, I want to touch upon some of the long-lasting side effects of female sterilization. Many potential effects have been put forth over the years, but only a few have held up under research. The first is changes in menstrual function. This has been studied many times, and the largest study was the CREST study, of which we're going to talk a lot about in a minute. The authors of that study found that a significant number of women had a decrease in menstrual flow and pain, but also had more irregular periods. The other three commonly cited potential side effects are decrease in ovarian reserve, a decrease in sexual function, and an increased breast cancer risk. In short, there does not seem to be any effect from tubal ligation by any method on any of these risks, and they do not need to be considered when counseling women. The last of what I guess would be considered a complication of sterilization is the risk of regret. Again, the CREST study gives us some of the best data. They found that 6% of women who had a tubal ligation over the age of 30 regretted the decision over the 14-year life of the study. For women under 30, that number was much higher, with a rate of 20%. Another smaller study from Puerto Rico found that regret increased 10% for every year under 44, which makes sense, as regret is on the whole likely to be directly related to the number of reproductive years remaining. Another way of looking at regret is to record how often women request reversal. Again, age is a factor here, with only 0.2% of women over 30 requesting reversal compared to 2% in women under 30. Other factors that increased regret were non-white race, single status, short interval between birth and sterilization, which becomes important when we talk about postpartum sterilization, and insurance status, with more women under state insurances expressing regret. Interestingly, parity does not seem to play into regret at all, with prima paris women expressing similar rates as paris women. Now the last method I want to talk about here before I get into the efficacy of the different methods is vasectomy. It is the only male sterilization technique that we have although there are a couple ways of going about it. The first technique was similar to partial salpingectomy, 
where an incision was made in the scrotum, and then the vas deferens was cut and the ends tied or burned. Due to complications such as pain, hematoma, and granulomas, this technique is seldom used in the United States or Europe. The Chinese were the first to modify this procedure by replacing the incision with a small puncture hole. Otherwise, they kept the surgery the same, but this small alteration substantially decreased the complication rate. This modified version is now the most common form of male sterilization today and has a hematoma and infection rate of about half a percent, as compared to the 5% of hematoma and infection with the traditional method. Okay, so I think it's time we talk in depth about that Crest study I keep mentioning. It was a multi center study performed between 1978 and 1986. All women were enrolled prior to having the sterilization procedure and were followed every year for up to 8 to 14 years. Over 10,000 women participated and they recorded only 143 failures over the course of the study, with about a third of them being ectopic pregnancies. The overall 10 year failure rate was 1.8%, with a range of 0.75% to 3.6%, varying by method. Plastics were novel in that they could be bent but then reform their natural shape without any chance of breakage. This allowed them to be collapsed for easier insertion and then to expand once inside the uterus. Still, however, most of these IUDs were quite large and led to high discontinuing rates due to pain. Since I mentioned it, let's take a detour to talk about the Dalcon Shield. This is one of the most famous, or infamous, IUDs, and its story highlights many of the cultural issues associated with IUDs. The Dalcon Shield was made of the same thermoplastics that had been pioneered by Margulies. It was shaped like a shield, hence the name, and had a multifilament thread that extended through the cervix for removal. For those of us used to the modern T design, is a very strange looking IUD, and the width of it made it very difficult to remove. It went on sale in 1971, and was marketed against the OCPs of the time, which you'll remember had a large number of side effects due to the high doses of estrogen and progesterone. Starting in 1973, the CDC started to investigate complications caused by the Dalcon Shield, and found that using it resulted in increased rates of septic abortion, resulting in dozens of fatalities. The particular design problem that led to these infections was the multifilament string, which acted as a wick for vaginal bacteria to make its way into the uterus. Subsequent IUDs used monofilament strings, and there was no increased risk of sepsis. However, this discovery was too late to save the Dalcon Shield, and the resulting lawsuits, of which there were over 300,000, drove the company out of business, and the fallout left a pall over the IUD industry for decades. Now, the Dalcon Shield wasn't the only IUD with problems, and investigations into IUDs by Roger Scott at Case Western University in the late 60s found 10 deaths and 15 bowel perforations in over 6,000 women. Based on this low rate of complications relative to other forms of available contraception, like the birth control pill, which you'll remember had high rates of DVTs, the FDA decided to approve IUDs in 1968. Now we just covered the tribulations of the second gen IUDs like the Dalcon Shield, but these were soon to be replaced in the late 70s by the first Copper T, which was the forerunner to the modern Paragard IUD. The Copper T was made possible by Jamie Zipper's work at the Wusser Institute, where he discovered the inhibited action of copper in 1973. He then worked with Howard Tatum, who utilized the copper with his new T-shaped IUD and together they demonstrated a 1% pregnancy rate with limited complications. His T design was remarkable for two reasons. First, it was much smaller than the IUDs of the time, and second, the collapsible arms of the T made it much easier to insert, and when these arms extended inside the uterus, they followed the natural contours of the endometrial cavity, which decreased pain and increased effectiveness. This new class of T IUDs were revolutionary and caught on in Europe but had trouble overcoming the fallout from the Dalcon Shield, whose lawsuits wouldn't be settled until the 1980s. This severely slowed the adoption of IUDs in the U.S. In 1982, about 4% of U.S. women used IUDs, but by 1995, it was less than 1%. The last major development in the world of IUDs was the progesterone-eluting IUD. This was first created in the mid-1970s by Antonio Somenga in Chicago. It was then melded with the newer T-shaped IUD by a Finnish doctor, Dr. Valtteri, and was released in 1976. It was only good for one year, and so never became very popular. He then changed the hormone to levonorgestrel, which increased the duration of effect from one year to five. 
This version was first released in 1990 in Europe, and in 2000 in the US. The introduction of this new IUD seems to have been the turning point in acceptance by US women, because the rate has more than tripled since the release of the Morena IUD, and now sits at about 6%. This number seems high, but when you compare it to Europe, it's actually quite low. The rates in Europe do range anywhere from 6% in Spain, but all the way up to 25% in Norway. Now obviously not all of this is due to the issues regarding the Dalcon Shield, but it did take several decades for the suspicion about IUDs to recede enough for women to embrace it again. Now, so that was some history about the IUD, but why did I spend so much time talking about it? Well, because frankly, it is the most effective form of reliable, reversible contraception that is available to women. It is just as effective as sterilization, which is the topic we'll get to in the next episode, and lasts for 5-10 to 10 years without any maintenance needed. Although there are larger upfront costs with IUDs, which can range from $100 to $1,000 depending on the type of IUD, cost of insertion, and insurance coverage, when you spread that out over 5-10 to 10 years, the cost becomes very comparable to pills or other forms. IUDs are considered to be safe, but there are risks of complications, especially during insertion. The most common is perforation of the uterus during placement, which can result in the IUD being placed into the abdominal cavity. This occurs in about 0.1% of IUD placements. Although there seems to be no life-threatening risk from this, it does take surgery to remove the wayward IUD, and it certainly doesn't provide contraception. This complication rate compares favorably with the risk of VTE when taking birth control pills, which occurs at about the same rate of 0.09%. The other noted risk from IUDs is infection. Numerous studies have shown that the only risk of infection with IUDs is in the first 20 days. After that, there seems to be no increased risk for STDs or other infections of the uterus due to the IUD. This probably is mostly due to the monofilament strings as opposed to the multifilament strings which you talked about with the Dalcon shield. Now to take a step back, there are currently two different types of IUDs available to women, and we've already talked about both of them. The first is the copper T in its various forms, and the second is the levonorgestrel IUDs. They are equally effective, but each comes with its own risks and benefits. The copper T, or Paragard in the US, lasts for 10 or more years, and the most common side effect is heavier menses, with about 60% of women reporting increased menstrual flow. It can also cause instrumental bleeding, bloating, increased menstrual pain, but these happen at much decreased rates as compared to the heavier menses. All these symptoms seem to dissipate by 12 to 24 months. Now there are other copper IUDs available throughout the world. There are 5-year and 3-year versions, as well as shorter ones for nulliparous women. The other main type of IUD, the levonorgestrel IUD, secretes its hormone over a 5-year period, and its pros and cons are both directly related to the effect of progesterone on the endometrium. Almost all women who have the levonorgestrel IUD develop some change in the menstrual cycle, with 12% having shorter periods, 20% who stop having them altogether, 24% with unpredictable bleeding, and 4% with heavier or longer periods. These menstrual effects usually settle out over 3-6 to six months, and women should be counseled adequately as these menstrual effects, especially the random bleeding, is the most common reason why women request removal. As a note, the levonorgestrel IUD, due to its actions on the endometrium, can be used for many other clinical scenarios, including endometriosis, menorrhagia, and endometrial hyperplasia, amongst others. Now these are outside the scope of today's conversation, but the levonorgestrel IUD has been a boon for many areas of GYN outside of contraception, and I thought that merited a mention. In any case, both IUDs offer great, maintenance-free, cost-effective contraception, and if women are adequately counseled regarding the side effects, their retention rates are high. IUDs are especially valuable in areas of the world without regular access to healthcare practitioners. IUDs can be inserted, and then no further visits are needed for the rest of the lifespan of the IUD. The copper IUD is particularly suited for this, and its use has skyrocketed throughout Southeast Asia, and especially in China, where it has been used to help enforce the one-child policy. But even in wealthier countries, the IUD is slowly but surely finding its way into the lives of many women, and I hope that we are not done innovating in this space. So we are now coming to the close on reversible contraception, and I think we have laid out the various forms and their pros and cons. Each method, from withdrawal to barrier to pills to IUDs, have their place in modern society, and their prevalence will wax and wane with their cost, women's access to health care, and societal pressure.
Now, I dragged us through all this history because I hope that if we understand that we already tried to suppress contraceptive access and failed, like the Comstock laws of the early 19th and 20th centuries, then we won't try again. Unfortunately, this seems to be exactly what the Republican Party in the U.S. is hellbent on trying to do. It seems that every generation of women will need a Margaret Sanger, or perhaps many of them, to fight for their contraceptive rights. This is a fact that makes me a little sad, but also drives me to keep fighting. I hope that this podcast, even though I'm sure it's mostly preaching to the choir, so to speak, will help in some small way, and reviewing this topic has certainly motivated me to do more. And with that, I think I will end our discussion